Hey, what's up guys? My name is The Turner. Welcome back to my game engine series. So last time we extended our 2D renderer and added texture support, check out that video if you haven't already. And we've been on this little kind of series here where we've just been working at this renderer 2D that we have, which is just a 2D renderer, which we're eventually going to make the standard kind of all encompassing 2D renderer in Hazel. Um, and I kind of like this, I guess, this section of the game engine series because every week we kind of just add more and more building blocks to that renderer. And today we're gonna to be taking a look at um, a little bit of an optimization, but also just kind of like a, uh, a fun little trick that we can do to simplify our 2D renderer. Because right now we've got kind of two sections to this. There's, well, there's this draw quad function, which does everything in the 2D renderer so far, but it either draws a flat color quad. So if we want like a red or a blue square or something like that, or any kind of rectangle, we use that function. But then there's also the draw quad that actually takes in a texture. And that's how we're drawing kind of the checkerboard background that we, that we had at the end of last video. Now that's great. And it's, you know, it's obviously required for us to basically have a flat color uh, draw quad function and then a textured one as well, because it's pretty often in a 2D render that you would of course want to draw like a kind of quad or something like that that is a particular color. But then also textures are very common and you know, we need, we need both of those functions. I don't think I need to explain that to you guys. But the problem is that they require a complete kind of state switch. So in other words, what has to happen is we need to basically we have to write two different shaders and then when it comes time to render this, what actually happens in the render 2D function is because we're doing immediate mode rendering now anyway, basically, um, you know, we're immediately kind of binding the shader and then doing the draw call. Um, and there are two different shaders and, you know, switching shaders is like a huge thing. Um, and in like, I mean, in OpenGL, it's probably not the biggest kind of thing, but just in graphics programming in general, if you want to switch your shader, like that could potentially be a massive operation. And that's definitely something that we want to avoid. Now, of course, there are ways to mitigate that. Um, I mean, we could, for example, take in every quad that we want to draw into some kind of like draw list, some kind of like command buffer, essentially. Um, and then that way we could, uh, you know, if you kind of do draw quad with color, so draw color, draw texture, draw color, draw, draw texture, or something like that, right, interleaved, which would be inefficient. If you put the, every time you do that, if you actually just kind of put them into that um, relevant draw command buffer, and then what happens is at the end, when you have all of that information, you know that you want to draw like 50 quads with colors and 50 quads with textures, you basically do them in two groups. So you bind your shader, you do all the quads, you bind your texture shader, and then you do all the textured quads, which is fine. Like that would be a, that would be a huge performance benefit right there immediately by not having to continually switch your entire graphics state. However, there's something that we can do better, and that is we can just have one shader. We don't need two shaders to draw a texture or a color. We can actually just use one shader. Um, and that requires a little bit of setup, and we'll talk about that today. We'll basically make it work today. But the plan is, let's just get rid of having these two different shaders. Let's just do everything in the one shader. But first, I want to give a huge thank you to all the patrons that made this series possible. Patreon, Uncle Force, slash the channel is the best way to support this series, apart from getting access to like the 3D kind of rendering version of Hazel with like, you know, a full viewer and everything like that, um, which I've talked about in previous episodes, as well as kind of standalone videos. You'll also get um, access to exclusive videos. And I'm doing exclusive videos videos about once a week now. Um, so I just released one a couple days ago, which was basically introducing Vulcan into Hazel because I've been working on that um, in the last few days. So if you guys are interested in stuff like that and just want to kind of keep up with what I'm doing, because obviously this game engine series is very kind of public facing. That's just like a tutorial series where we go through episode by episode. Whereas what I'm doing behind the scenes and what I'm doing, I guess, in my kind of personal life, so to speak, not personal life, personal life, but as in like the programming that I'm doing outside of what you see in these tutorial series, if you're interested in stuff like that, then definitely check out um, patreon.com forward slash the channel because you'll get access to all of those exclusive videos. You'll get access to just everything that's in the backlog immediately, which I think is pretty cool. Um, you can also uh, follow me on Instagram if you want. Um, I've basically been trying to be more active there lately and I'm going to be posting videos on just what I'm doing day to day kind of on Instagram stories and stuff like that. So that's your thing. If you're into that, then check out the links in the description. All right. so. Two shaders, let's collapse that into one shader. Let's talk about, first of all, how we can even make that happen. So just looking over the architecture here, um, it's fairly basic. Like if we look at the actual 
uh, draw commands that we're issuing here. We have our begin scene and then we have two quads that are drawn. One is red, one is blue, and then we have a checkerboard texture. Now this kind of checkerboard texture is very big. There's a scale. Um, it's a lot bigger than anything else. It's kind of acting as our background. But ultimately what happens is when we draw a quad with a color, so this last parameter being a color instead of a texture, what it basically does is bind our flat color shader um, set that float for uh, uniform, which is the actual color, um, and then set up the transform, which is which has to be done for both cases anyway. And then we just kind of bind the vertex array and do the, the draw. Um, if we look at the, te the texture version, what that does is it just binds the texture. So really the only thing, oh sorry, binds the texture shader, sets the transform and then binds the texture. Um, and in fact, I might just move the texture to being uh, before the transform. So the transform will kind of do last. No particular reason for that, just organization purposes, because you can see that this more closely matches what we have over here. Um, okay, cool. So anyway, these are the two kind of important functions. Um, in here, we're doing the, uh, the shader binding and the color uniform, right? But here we're doing instead of the flat color shader, we're binding the texture shader, and then we're doing the texture binding. So those are the two big differences, and of course what that means is that we do have two shaders. Now last time I showed you guys a pretty cool little thing that we could do. If I go to my shader here, we go into assets, shaders, and then uh, texture shader, or texture.glsl. So what this was, was the actual uh, texture shader that we wrote, and then what I did was, um, instead of basically, oh, I did two things to kind of modify your typical texture shader here. First of all, I multiplied the texture coordinates by 10, which gave us that tiling effect because that texture sampling mode was set to repeat. Um, and then this is me multiplying our texture, the, the result of our texture sample, right? Which is basically the color of that pixel of the texture that we're trying to render. Um, we're multiplying that color by another color, right? In this case, you can see that, um, well, we're keeping the red and the alpha channels the same, but then we're kind of lowering um, the uh, green and blue channels to about 80%, well, to exactly 80% of their value, right? So we're basically tinting it red because we're leaving red alone, but then changing blue and green. Um, now that's fine. And that's gonna be the basis of how we're going to be able to combine uh, basically both of these shaders into one, right? In the case of us having a, a color a color shader, so we don't want any kind of texture rendering at all. We basically need to bind a texture here that is gonna be pure white. If we leave this unbound, it's gonna probably, well, it's, it's I think it's technically undefined. Um, in most drivers that I've seen, it's just gonna return black, right? And black, of course, having a value of zero means that if we multiply it with a color, that's also gonna give us zero, which is useless. It's just gonna give us black. Whereas we want to basically uh, have a texture that we can sample from that just returns one, being like pure white, right? And then of course, if we kind of multiply one by anything, well, this one kind of gets factored out of the equation. It's almost like we have a little branch that just says ignore that. Um, you know, we're just gonna use the color. And then of course, in the reverse case, so when we want to sample from the texture because we bound the texture um, and we don't want to use the color at all, right, then you basically can just set this color to one. And then if you set that color to one, then it, it gets kind of, it's irrelevant to the equation. So that's, that's the idea. Now, of course, we could take a more simple approach here by basically just having a uniform bool or something like that, that just basically says, you know, am I using texture bound or something like that? Am I using a texture? And then if we do that, um, we could just have like a little branch that says, if the texture is bound, sample from the texture. If it's not, then use the color. That's not really ideal or efficient at all. Um, it's much better to basically just have a default texture bound um, that is just gonna be basically a one by one texture, right? Really tiny texture that just has the value one there as our default texture and then sample like this instead of doing any kind of branch switching. Okay, so that's the plan for today. It should be pretty simple to implement. Let's just dive in and take a look at how we can do that. So the first step to this is that texture, right? If we just kind of take this away, right? Um, and actually the first thing I might do is modify the, the shader. So let's get rid of this flat color shader. Um, this texture shader that we have here, um, I'll still call it texture shader, uh, even though it's gonna be more than that. So we'll get rid of flat color shader. And then this texture shader that we have here, let me just open this. And I'll also open the flat color one because we need to steal some things from there. So this flat color shader has this uniform that I want, which is the U color uniform. So if we go back to our um, uh, shader, what I'll, what I'll do to our texture shader is I'll add another uniform that's gonna be the color and that's what we'll use instead of this, right? So instead of just hard coding that value there, we're gonna take in a uniform for it. Now this is a times 10 little texture scale thing. 
I'll leave it there for now, but obviously you probably want to remove that and just have it like this. And if you really want to have a texture scale, well, maybe you could add a uniform, which is like your texture scale or something like this, right? But for now, just because I still want that tiling effect, just for fun, really, um, I'm just gonna keep it there. Okay, so, th so there we have it. That's really all the modification we have to make to our shader. Now it actually takes in a color. Um, and the other cool thing that you could do here is basically what I described in the last episode as well, which is that if you do want to use a texture, like you have that checkerboard background, but you want to tint it a particular color, then you can also do that um, just by multiplying it with uh, U color and then setting U color to something other than the white. If you set U color to white, it'll just basically again be one, which means that that's, irre that's irrelevant to the equation, which means that it's just the texture that you're going to see, right? Um, but if you obviously don't pass it in as one, if you pass it in as like 0.5 in the alpha channel, for example, then you'll get that texture at half opacity, for example, which is um, something that could potentially be useful uh, to what you're doing. Okay, cool. So that's that, that's that shader done. Um, again, I've gotten rid of the flat color shader. Now we always bind the texture shader. Um, and in fact, if we kind of do a begin scene here, right, and then draw all the quads, then technically speaking, begin scene should bind our shader, and that should be it. We no longer should be binding our shader at every draw. Now, um, whether or not this is even worth discussing is uh, questionable, just because this is, of course, a very simple 2D renderer, and things are going to be very different once we actually build a proper one. But um, for now, yeah, you could just get rid of that um, that bind uh, entirely. And obviously we don't have to set up the projection matrix twice either. We just bind the texture shader because that's our only shader now. And then we actually set that UV projection map four and that's it, that's ready to go. The next thing we need to do is basically set uniforms like float four, um, which is the color. Uh, and then like transform and basically stuff like that. Okay, so this becomes part of the texture shader. So if we submit a um, if we submit a quad with a color, then obviously we want to upload that uniform color, right? And then what we need to do is bind our white texture here, right? So that's what needs to happen. We obviously don't have a white texture yet, so we'll do that in a minute. Um, and then the other thing that's important is over here for draw quad, where we actually draw a textured quad, we still need to set the U color, otherwise it'll be left over from what it was last time. So in other words, if we draw if we drew a red uh, square earlier, and then now we're trying to draw a textured quad, then what will happen is it will tint it red. So we don't really want that. Um, probably at this rate, if you just specify a texture, no kind of tinting color, which might be something that you do, as I mentioned, then you can just basically set this color to just be one, 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 right? Or in fact, I think it's probably a little bit better if we just try GLM Vec for one, right? So this is just going to be pure white, no change on any of the values of our texture. Okay, cool. So that's that. Um, again, if we try and run this right now with no texture bound, this is probably going to give us black, two black quads, um, or actually it might, they might all be textured with the checkerboard texture. I don't know why it's taking so long to compile suddenly. I guess I changed the header. Actually, did I even change the header? I'm not even sure why it's doing a full recompile. Um, yeah, so you can see what it's done is it's actually um, given us that checkerboard texture multiplied by 10 with the, that's why it's so kind of high resolution, I guess, because it's multiplied our texture coordinates by 10 as well. And it's kind of tinted them. So that's exactly what I kind of described, right? With the tinting effect that you can achieve. Um, now, obviously we don't want this to be textured. The reason it's like this is because when we render, um, we bind this texture, right? And then that's it. It's just, that's the state of OpenGL. The texture is bound until something else gets bound to that slot, to that texture slot um, or unbound, right? So. I don't know if we have an unbind function, um, but if we do, no, we don't, do we? Okay. If we did have an unbind function, which we don't, um, and we kind of bound uh, slot zero here, so what, what I could do just to cheat, I guess, is just basically do gl bind texture and then into gl texture 2D, and then I'll just bind nothing, right? So in other words, we're basically clearing that texture slot, nothing's gonna be bound. If I do something like that, and let me just get back to where I was before, um, then this is kind of like a, a good little debug test, I guess. Um, I don't know what that is. Um, so if I do that, then what we should probably expect to see is just black, basically. Yeah, and you can see that we're getting black. The reason is that we're, we're sampling from a texture that's not bound at all, right? Which is not something we should be doing. So that's where that kind of white texture comes in. Now, what we could do is just open Photoshop real quick and just make literally a one by one pixel texture that's just filled with white and then load it in as a file and do all that. 
Clearly that's completely unnecessary. What we should do is just extend our texture API a little bit just to make it so that we can basically create a texture just on the GPU and then set its data just from code without having to load any kind of file at all. So let's do that. Inside our texture header file here, um, really the only thing that I wanna add, well, I wanna add two things. We have this texture 2D create function, which is great and it takes in a path. Instead, what I'm gonna do is create a texture of a given size. Now, in the future, we definitely want to extend this with things like format because we might want to create a texture of a particular format, you know, with particular sampling properties or like mip mapping properties, stuff like that. Um, that's, you know, creating textures, textures in general are just, you know, obviously hugely complicated in what they're kind of used for and the kind of, I guess, scope of everything they can include and how you would want to like, um, I guess, customize your texture or set the properties of your texture. So that's going to take way too long for me to just do that now and it's irrelevant. Um, so just keep that in mind in the future. Um, I mean, I keep saying this, but I just want you guys to realize that obviously uh, there's a lot more to this than what it might seem. So width and height um, are what we have here. By the way, there is in Hazel, where is it, in core.h, because um, uh, a bunch of pull requests were accepted here. There's now a function called create scope and create ref, which is quite useful. So what this does, as you can see, is just a little function here that basically um, just maps to make shared. Uh, for in the case of create ref. So instead of us typing in make shared, we can just type in create ref, which is a little bit cleaner. So that's kind of cool. Um, I guess I kind of like that. So we'll use that from now on instead of make shared and then create scope. Similarly, we'll, we'll do a make unique. Okay, so there we, there we have width and height of the OpenGL texture, which is great. Um, if we go to OpenGL texture, we'll add that constructor. Uh, and then uh, unit 32 width, unit 32 height. Um, and then the other thing that we need uh, that's really important uh, is for us to actually be able to set the data of the texture, which we can't do right now. So I'll add a function called virtual void set data, void pointer uh, data, and then un32 size. Um, and we'll set that equal to zero. So what this function does, the purpose of this function is to basically, uh, for you to be able to give a pointer to a block of memory and for it to upload that to the GPU. Um, yeah, that's really as simple as it is. So in the case of uh, our texture 2D for OpenGL, we'll override this, of course. Um, I will use Visual Assist to implement the constructor and, and that function. So there we go. Uh, this constructor I'll pull up to the top um, just because this is kind of our base no file constructor. And honestly, um, you know, the other thing that we could do, by the way, really easily um, is just have like our kind of data here. Um, and that's no issue, and that's probably the optimal way to make textures here. But I just want to keep this API a little bit more simple at this stage. Um, and it's just going to be more powerful if we can set the data later, because that might be useful for, um, you know, if you need to update your texture data, for example, while uh, everything's, while, while, like after you've created the texture. Okay, so as for this, um, really simple. We'll copy basically starting from about here onwards, I think. We'll copy everything up to the image free. Um, now we have a texture sub image and all of that stuff. We don't really need any of that. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah, we don't need that because we, we do the texture storage here. That should be enough. Um, that should work. So what we'll do is we'll get rid of all this. And again, as I mentioned, it's, you know, we'll kind of make an RGBA texture here. Um, but in general, you probably want to, uh, you know, have this parameterized so that you can specify what format you want in the constructor. Um, okay, we'll get rid of that assert because uh, clearly that's going to be fine. Um, they're not going to be zero. We will set width and height. That's really important. Um, like that. Uh, internal format, data format is set. That's good. And then we basically create textures. We set this up again. You know, this stuff is set to repeat for now. This stuff is, to, is set to linear and nearest. This is also stuff that you want to parameterize. Um, all right, but that's kind of it, I think that's done. So now what we wanna do is probably go down, okay, we'll do the set data. So this is really easy, we just do GL texture sub image 2D. Um, this is like, I guess a relatively new function. Um, well, I mean, it's the same one that we're using here, right? In fact, so I can probably copy that. Um, we can fill it out ourselves though. Uh, you know, in the past you'd have to do like a GL bind texture and then a GL text sub image 2D. Um, so you can still do it that way, but you can see that that basically takes in a target instead of a, um, a renderer ID basically. So it's a little bit worse because it's 
kind of two lines of code instead of one, and it's two GL calls. We don't need that. So level zero, uh, X offset, Y offset zero. So at the moment, this is gonna set the entire texture, right? Um, so width and height, it will actually set from width and height. Um, and then the format will be whatever the format is recorded as. Now, I don't really want to hard code that. So I'll set the format to, and this is, uh, what is the format actually? It's a GL enum. So we'll use GL enum here. Um, we'll have, that's going to be our, uh, mm, so we'll have, I guess we'll have internal format and just the format like that. Um, and then we might need glad to be included, which is fine. Of course, this is an open jail header file, so no issues there. Um, and then what I'll do, I guess, is instead of, um, well, over here, I'll set internal format to internal format. Um, and then format for format, just in case we end up using this in the future, we definitely don't want to. Um, and I guess data format, I might change this to be data format. We definitely don't want to rely on that and then realize that actually when I'm setting it for the case of loading a texture from a file. So we might as well just complete that. Um, and then we'll kind of do the same thing, I guess, for here. We'll set the internal format and the data format to that. Now I might as well just get rid of that, I guess. I don't think there's going to be any issue with setting a member variable versus a local variable here. Um, okay, so internal format and data format has been set. Um, we actually don't need the data format here, which is nice, but we'll still set it up because we'll need it probably for uh, here, um, for our actual sub image. So this is the format. So this is now the data format because we're specifying data in this case, not the kind of internal representation, which is basically how shaders will sample from it. Um, and then we have the type, which is gonna be always be GL unsigned bytes. So I've got no issue just hard coding that. Uh, and then the data, right, which will just be data. Now you might have noticed if you were paying attention that size was not used anywhere. That's because um, instead of us actually specifying a size for the buffer, OpenGL wants us to specify width and height and you can see that also an X and Y offset. So we're basically specifying like a subregion. Um, of course, going from zero to zero to width and height, um, it's the entire texture. So there, there is no subregion basically, but it does support that. That's why it's written this way. Other rendering APIs typically treat textures as just a block, like a buffer of data. So in that case, you do need kind of data and size and that's it. Um, OpenGL doesn't. So this function for us just kind of will stream in the entire texture data, right? So we could just for safety's sake, put a little cert here that says that uh, size, right, has to equal width times height times whatever the format is, right? So the format right now is RGBA. Um, so basically, uh, well, I'll set up a little size thing here. So what should we call this? Uh, bytes, I guess, per pixel. So what this will do, um, and per channel is actually what we want. Um, so bytes per channel, right? So what this will do is um, if the data format uh, is actually going to be RGBA, for example, then we basically just say that we're gonna, you know, it's gonna be four bytes per channel. And of course, four bytes per channel is ridiculous. So it actually was four bytes per pixel, all the pressure of being on camera here. Um, and then if it's RGB, which is the only other format we support at this point, um, cause we've got RGB and RGBA, then it's gonna be three bytes per pixel, right? So in that case, we need to multiply this here. So what will happen in this case is, we're basically just asserting that the size is in fact equal to uh, the size of our, the size in bytes that we're specifying here. It has to be the entire, the buffer has to be the size of the entire texture because we have to give it a full texture's worth of data. If we don't, like we don't currently support doing that. So basically um, data must be entire texture. All right, cool. So there we go, just a little assert there to make sure that everything's fine. Um, and of course, you know, you probably don't want to do this calculation, like for example, if we're not asserting, but you know, we'll leave it like that for now. Okay, cool. So that's it, right? That should give us everything that we need. So if we go back to renderer 2D, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically make a texture here, ref texture, uh, texture 2D, and this is going to be a, just a white texture, right? It's going to be our standard white texture. After the index buffer, I'll make it. So I'll say white texture, s data arrow white texture equals texture 2D create. Uh, one by one is gonna be the size of the texture. And then I'm just gonna basically set its data. So the way that we'll set the data is we will make a UN32T called uh, text data, I guess, or white texture data. Um, and then we'll just set it equal to FF, 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 right? So full Fs for every channel there. 
um, for an RGBA texture. And then I'll give a pointer to that data. And then the size, of course, in this case, is just gonna be the size of Y texture data or the size of a uint 32T, which is four bytes. So there we go. So that should all work. Obviously you shouldn't assert, nothing should happen uh, bad at all. Um, that should be fine, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah, really simple, one by one texture and a swipe. Great. So now, uh, when we bind our white texture here, we theoretically just should be able to bind it and like that should be it, right? So the same way that we bind the texture that we specify here, in this case, we're binding that white texture. Now let's hit F5 and see what happens. All right, and as you can see, we kind of get the, I guess, expected result where it's just a white texture, we're multiplying it with the color, so we get those original colors that we were looking for. Um, and then, of course, with uh, our actual texture where we supply a texture, we get that particular um, texture that we've specified. Now again, if you wanted to tint this for whatever reason, instead of specifying one here like we kind of have, you can basically specify, um, well, something that's not uh, not white, right? So for example, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.8, which seems to be like my favorite thing ever. Um, and then I think we can do a bit of blending as well, so maybe like 0.5, right? So if you do something like uh, that, um, then you will actually get a tint. So now the tint is kind of C++ side instead of being high coded in the shader, you can see it's now tinted like blue basically, and it should also be about half transparency. So you can see everything's kind of darker because that background is dark. Um, so that's something that you can do if you're into that uh, and you can parameterize that and have like a particular texture tint, or maybe you can even have a state that you set for the renderer where every texture is gonna be tinted. Anyway, up to you guys, have fun with that. But basically um, what we've done here, I think is pretty cool. We've collapsed our two shaders into a single shader, which is pretty awesome. Um, now we do, uh, yeah, now we don't do any kind of shader binds at all. We just begin seeing, we do one shader bind and that is it. Now I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit the like button. And as mentioned earlier, you can help support the series by going to patreon.com forward slash the churno. Um, yeah, let me know what you think of this of this approach. I quite like doing things like that. So little, little kind of optimizations. Um, which are really nice to do and kind of make both the code and the actual runtime state switching stuff like that a lot simpler, which is kind of what you want with graphics programming. Um, now, this is all great, but obviously we have no way to actually see these changes um, in terms of the effect that they have on our performance because we're not profiling anything at all. Um, we could use Visual Studio's profiling tools, but apart from being a little bit, mm, a little bit like not as robust as I would like them to be. We obviously want some general runtime profiling that Hazel can actually provide so that we can do it on every platform independent of things like compilers and um, and like development environments. So basically from the, from the next episode onwards, probably we're gonna do a little mini series on performance profiling. So we're gonna be writing some kind of, uh, I guess a, a performance measuring and metrics system for Hazel. And we'll probably end up extending that to include things like, well, we definitely want CPU time, but also probably things like memory. So that should be pretty exciting, taking a little bit of a deeper dive into like, uh, I guess some of the auxiliary support stuff that we want to have in the engine so that when we do kind of develop it further, we can be really aware of like, hey, how slow is this? You know, what's going on here? You know, uh, it, it, like, is this thread idle? This is gonna be so important when we start dealing with different threads as well, because being able to like visualize basically what's going on and actually see it like on a timeline, that's kind of what we're gonna be working towards. So I think that'll be really cool. And I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.